Welcome back to Creep Week 5, Episode 4. And hey, Adventures in Design is going nowhere. The Circle of Trust is growing stronger by the day. Everything's great. Yesterday, as I'll explain, was a manipulation of your mind. (laughs) Speaking of manipulating time and space... Have you been to our friends over at jackprince.com? That's right. Maybe a tiche is what you need to make. Maybe you need to make a custom tiche or a sweating shirt. Or maybe you need a hat for a ghoul that has no head. Why would he need the hat? Who knows? No one questions a ghoul, my friend. Head over to jackprince.com slash circle of trust where you'll save on stickers notebooks, posters, fabrics, beautiful luscious fabrics from the most deadliest places of the Nile. Each one comes with a mosquito that will either give you a superpower or leave you dead in the street. (laughs) Creep Week has been going for five years strong and Jack Prince has been there all along because they believe in me and they believe in you and they believe in the c-o-t head over to jackprince.com whatever you need to make they can make it great and on a budget use the coupon code jackprince.com slash circle of trust good evening and good design. Welcome back to Creep Week 5, Episode 4. On the show today, a man that created, birthed a monster from his own loins. Sit back and enjoy yourself on a creep festival like none other. Hey friends, welcome back to Creep Week 5, Episode 4. Before I get started with today's guest, I would like to talk about yesterday's episode. Episode 960, final episode with Mark and Billy. Now, what I wanted to do, and the way that I pitched this to Billy was, let's record the scariest episode that we could ever put together. And the idea and this is the way that we did it, is I wrote out a timeline of everything that could potentially happen over the next year. None of it was crazy. It was all just taking sort of the the things that are happening right now in the news, all the explosive pressure points that we have in our society, and just saying, well, if this one happened, how could it affect that one? So if there was an environmental or a water crisis, how would that affect the economy? How would the economy be affected with all the deregulation? If one of the Supreme Justices were to pass away, how would that stack up for women's rights? If it was Ruth Ginsburg, how would it all come together? If there was a terrorist attack on white America, how would that affect the base that can clearly be scared into voting a certain way. The whole timeline that I created for Billy and I just to have in front of us and just to sort of jump around on, it's all just a little bit away from the truth. It's just all a little bit away from where we're at right now. So the idea of creating the scariest episode ever and framing it as the end of AID was to create a real thriller a real mental moment for many people where they thought, oh my God, the show is gone. It is called Halloween. It is a trick or a treat. And yesterday was the trick, the trick of making you feel something or reacting or wondering, is this real? 
Some people claim clickbait. I said, no, it was an exercise of the mind. And my intentions of doing it wasn't just to shock you or to move, move you or make you wonder what was going on. My intention was to do a couple of things. One, I wanted to show you how fragile the world we live in truly is. Everything is always hanging together just by a thin thread. When you look at it that way, when you think about everything that we talked about isn't that far away from being true. Point two, I wanted us all to realize what a blessing Adventures in Design has been that we've been able to complain about design fees, clients that pay late, dream gigs that we didn't get, disappointment in social media or YouTube responses, like all of that, everything we've complained about is an absolute pleasure of a complaint. We have all lived, even though we've been frustrated while doing it, we have lived a charmed life for the last six years since this project has been going out. But when you look at it through the lens of destruction, that's when you realize how lucky you and I have been and that we are to have these lives. The next point was to vote, was to stand up, to realize that we have a moral obligation to be the generation that takes America back. Now, some people complain that if it was about voting at the end, there should have been a message and said, now go vote. I thought about that. And I thought that putting a disclaimer at the end cheapened the idea of it. I wanted to make a real slice of life that would make you think about how fragile things are, how lucky we are, and that we have a moral responsibility to react. And I know a lot of people, they want to stay neutral. They don't want to get involved because they don't want to ruin what they have. But friend, you might not be that far away from losing it all anyway. So you can be quiet and see what happens and let someone else fight the fight for you. Or you can roll up your sleeves and fight your own goddamn fight. That was the intention. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to raise some ways. And I knew that with the contentious last episode that Billy and I put out, that there was a window to sell the idea, to sell the concept, and it looks like maybe we were too good at it because there were people that I was convincing all day not to cancel their subscription to the Circle of Trust, that I wasn't becoming a parking valet, and I was shocked at how much in the episode... There hasn't been a water shortage of the Great Lakes. They're not contaminated. There wasn't a terrorist attack in West Virginia on 4th of July. Uh, the, the Supreme Justice didn't pass away. That didn't happen. Like There were so many factual things put in there that aren't true. And people just breezed right past it, which kind of scared me and made me realize how easy it truly is to manipulate an audience. People hear what they want to hear. They breeze past the things that they don't want to hear. To that, I feel a little bit of moral responsibility that I might have been, uh, I don't know, irresponsible in my broadcasting. But anyways, it's creep week. It's a time to have fun. And I got some of you. I gave some of you the Halloween spirit for all that it's worth. And there was people that were legitimately scared for a moment that AID was going away forever. And you were scared. You didn't want to lose the show. And for that, mwah, I love you. I love you that you cared. I love you that it mattered to you. And I hated that I had to spend so much of my day talking people off the ledge. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm not parking cars. Uh, there's no GoFundMe. I, I appreciate it. Everything's fine. Re-listen to the episode. I planted over 20 Easter eggs in the episode to point to the fact that it was not real. What a wild day that was. And it felt weird posting something online that basically people that don't pay attention would just read and go, huh, that's over. And there's probably people still today that just think, yeah, Bricky gave up. It's over. And a lot of people are like, man, I understand why you quit. I'm like, I don't. It's going great. 
I've created a business where there was none. I'm making a fantastic living. I'm meeting lots of great people. We're telling so many interesting and amazing stories. And we've created a platform and a community where creative people can come together and understand that it's not fucking easy, but it surely is worth it. One of those stories happens today. Now, why you're going to love today's episode is... Every single one of us have that mindset of the client only asked for four, but I'm going to work 10 times harder. I'm going to give them 40 because I really want the gig. I want them to know that I'm worthy of it and that I'm a hard worker. I've done it and I know you've done it. And many times it's gone unnoticed and unappreciated and you didn't get the job. So sometimes you get older. I have. You get jaded. I did. And you start to question how hard should I work? I do that. Should I still apply myself? Should I still put it all in? And the answer is, sometimes, when the opportunity is right, yes, you should. Because today's guest did just that thing. On vacation, got an email. We want you to create something for our NHL team, the Philadelphia Flyers, one of the coolest teams in all of the sport. A legacy team. My bud Carl. Her dad played for the team. That's right. A Broad Street bully. Frank Bathe. Look him up. Google it. But Brian Allen got asked to do this. And he worked hard on it. He worked so hard. He dedicated himself to a ridiculous timeline and got it done. And did a fantastic job. And in doing so, he birthed a monster. A true monster. A creature that made everyone cringe and react, and it made all the headlines. It went from local news to the evening news to the national news to late night talk shows. Our guest today has had his creation, his monster, his idea ridiculed and picked on and made fun of by nearly every format you could imagine of mainstream media. How the fuck would that make you feel? You kill yourself. You get the job done, it goes your way, goes out into the world, and you get three or four or a week, those are days translated into a week, of just constant ridicule. People saying that what you created is an abomination, a monster. But, and this is the rarest part of the whole story, the client fights back. The client knows how to embrace the narrative And all of a sudden, it turns. And your monster turns into a real piece of pop culture. Today's guest, Brian Allen of Flyland Designs. He's the type of guy I love to talk to because he's worked twice as hard as he should have. He's put in all the hours. And it's not an overnight success story. He's a fantastic illustrator. A guy who likes a style that I'm going to say isn't completely relevant, but for those that love it, he's absolutely killing it and the best at what he does. He's a fast, prolific designer. Reminds me of the old school where guys, you could throw anything at them, give them two or three days, and they'd have you 20 comps and they'd all look pro as hell. He's that guy. He's our generation of what an illustrator used to be. This gig with Gritty, I hope that it changes his career, changes the path that he's on, and it's the big win that he deserves. And I know we should not think that we deserve anything from the world because the world doesn't owe us anything, but man, sometimes you feel like it does. And sometimes you see somebody who's a good dude busting his hump and you want it to happen. You want it to happen for them. Go over to his website, Flyland Designs. Check out the brushes that he creates for an illustration program called Clip Studio Paint. Not the greatest name in the world for an, for an app, but he swears by it. He's a fantastic illustrator, uh, and it's a cheap illustration program, much cheaper than the Creative Cloud. There's a lot of customization to it, 
And if you like it, the iOS version isn't a watered down. It's the real deal that you can put on your iPad Pro if that's where, like myself, you enjoy illustrating. He's created these brushes. They're super cheap for $9. You can get like 520 of them. And it's even less than that because if you use the coupon code COT, you're going to save. I just wanted to get that out because I know that it's something that he's worked really hard on. And I don't mind giving a plug to somebody who is a supporter of the show and somebody that I think is worthy of the support. So in today's episode, what you're going to listen to is what we've all wanted. Every time we hit upload, every time we turn a project in, we're all dreaming of hitting viral. It's got some good parts. It's got some bad parts. But in the end, let's hope that it works out for your new friend, Brian Allen, father of Gritty, the man who created a monster. <laughs> Sorry about yesterday if it rubbed you the wrong way. I had to do it. I'm an artist. Brian Allen, father of Gritty. Welcome to Creep Week. Welcome to Adventures in Design, sir. How you doing, Mark? Thanks so much for having me. Man, you hit one of those wild moments where you just got hired to do a job. We're all just doing jobs. We're all just doing work. But I feel like every time I hit upload on a podcast or every time that you do a design or illustration project, you're always just hoping that you'll hit that new thing in this world known as viral, right? Like maybe this will be the project right. that gets me discovered. People find out about me. People start talking about me, but it's not always the dream that we think it is, right? Like at times being quote unquote discovered can turn into a nightmare, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I've never been involved in anything this big. Most of the projects that I work on day to day are for small or medium sized businesses. The bread and butter of our business is just working with smaller businesses, medium sized businesses. And then, you know, a couple times a year, maybe every few months, we have a, a bigger job come along. Yeah. So when I got I got this email that just simply said it was just one sentence and just said, you know, do you have time to do some concept artwork on a very tight timeline? Give me a call. And then I, you know, that didn't sound unusual, but I scroll down and the signature is from some dude from the flyers. Right. So, you know, being doubting myself, I, I pretty much had to look up, like, is there a minor league team called the flyers? <laughs> is, 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 you this know, is this the Philadelphia di- flyers? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, you know, the Norway flyers. But, right. Uh, a- anyway. Um, so I, I called them immediately. And the way they were exploring this job is they knew they needed a new mascot, but they already had some in-house concepts because they have an in-house art department, but they wanted to reach out to try to get like kind of a different edgier take on it. Mm -hmm. So they saw some of my artwork for a previous mascot that I had done and they hired me to just do the first stage, which was just creating a series of concept sketches. Yeah. And when I entered the job, I knew that there was a good chance that if they didn't see anything they liked, then that'd be the end of it. They right. wouldn't move forward to the next stage. So um, I, they asked for four concept sketches. They gave me very little direction. But what I did was I spent two days just drawing as many sketches as I could in those two days. How did you draw those sketches? They were, uh, it was a mixture of pencil on paper and Mm -hmm. digital. Uh, I have a Wacom Cintiq Pro, uh, which is like a monitor that you draw on. And um, I I use a program called Clip Studio Paint, which is a lot like Photoshop. And you created your own brushes, right, that you sell to people. Yeah, I have a whole series of custom brushes um, that I sell on my website that have been really popular, luckily. And uh, so I drew 25 completely different concepts of this mascot uh i explored like dragons bulldogs bulls like a bully character even a bat at one point which was actually one of my favorites and i just threw them all at them and i think a week or two went by and i was just waiting for their 
the feedback I do from working on other projects like this, that there might be a good chance that I don't even uh, get picked to move forward. Sure. Cause I had a suspicion, you know, they possibly could have even been working with other artists at the time. Sure. Though I, I don't know. But anyway, I, w- I was on vacation and I get the call that basically they picked one and they want to move forward. And it was kind of a total shock because that meant that whatever we continue with is going to be the, the new mascot. And that, that was a big deal for me. So let's backtrack here a minute. So when sure. you when you sent them over these comps, right? Like they were like, we want to see what you could do for a mascot. Here's very, very loose instructions. What can you make out of it? How many did you send them? Uh, I sent them 25 uh, different sketches, and they had only asked for four. When you send 25 of them over to them? Yeah. And they were some of them were pretty loose. Like, were they pencil? Did you go back over them in your Wacom and, like, clean them up and, and make them all, like, at least black line on white? Like, how defined were these 25? They were really loose. Uh, I only spent about 25 minutes on each one. Yeah. The point... The point I was trying to do was to leave a little bit to the imagination, yeah. but still communicate this is like the direction I want to look at. And they, um, the only direction they gave me going into this, which I, which I thought was great, is they said that, and we didn't even know the name at this point, but they were referring to him as being somebody fierce and gritty, mm-hmm. and they wanted him to be someone that people would want to high five and take a picture with, but not hug. Yeah. So. It had to be, you know, it had to be kind of uh, cuddly for the kids, but at the same time, he had to be like a tough hockey mascot. So it was a really tough line to walk because some of my sketches actually went too creepy. Of course. Which I think it's probably funny because you know, a lot of people think Gritty is super creepy. Um, and then other mascots were just too friendly and cute and cuddly. But that's the fine line of the Philadelphia Flyers, right? Like it's a. Uh... I would say it's an aggressive city, like the citizens of Philly, you know, they'll turn on you on a second. Like, you know, we've talked about several times on the show. These are the people that threw snowballs at Santa Claus. Like they're snowballs at Santa Claus. They're they're a rowdy crowd. I I told my friend, I called him up when I got this job and I knew he was a huge Flyers fan and uh, I sent him a message and then he immediately called me and he's like, dude, they throw, they throw snowballs at Santa Claus, man. You got to be careful. And uh, he helped me actually through the whole process. He helped me a little bit in kind of, I, I would throw ideas at him and he would come back at me on things he thought would work and it wouldn't. So he was kind of my inside guy. The reason why I thought gritty was so well done is that it, you accidentally or purposefully, you stumbled, stumbled onto something that was quite amazing. It looked familiar. It felt like something from the seventies. It felt like something from maybe Jim Henson. Like there was a moment in the seventies where they used a lot of puppets to do children's programming, like great space coaster and, you know, McDonald's used them for all their mascots and you know, the Muppets was a huge thing. And so it had this familiar background monster vibe to it. Cause like in the Muppets, you know, there was always the monsters that were in the audience, in the background and, most guys our age, those were the characters that you always wanted to know a little bit more about, right? Like Snuffleupagus was easily the coolest design dude on Sesame street, but he was very much a bit player like, you know, and they wouldn't tell you more about his world. Like he just kind of came in sometimes as this sad sack, but he looked rad because he looked scary. And so what you're able to do is make something that kind of called from that. The flyers have, sort of a 70s vibe with their logo, which I think is the best logo in the NHL. The orange and black and white. Like the, it's just a perfectly branded team. And then you threw Gritty in. And when I saw Gritty, I said, here's something that feels completely familiar, but 100% unique. And you just really, you made an icon. And an icon is something that everybody strives for every time they make a mascot, every time they make a logo. But very seldom do you hit that finite target and you just literally shot it right in that little narrow space and boom, you blew up the Death Star. Oh, well, thanks so much, man. Uh, I'm sure it was mostly accidental, uh, but I, I was heavily influenced by Jim Henson stuff. When when I started, I got an entire – my wall was filled up with a photo of every NHL mascot yeah. uh, that exists. 
because that was one challenge we had going into this. They're the second to last team to pick a mascot. So pretty much any animal you can name was was taken already. Yeah. You know? So I I started pasting up pictures of other mascots to make sure that we did something very different. And the art directors kind of knew that they wanted to make it look like the Philly fanatic and the, right. and gritty were kind of from the same like universe. universe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but other than that, I started looking at pictures of uh, Sesame street creations and like the dark crystal creations yeah. and things like that, that really heavily influenced me as a kid, because that was one of their strongest uh, directions was that, they wanted Gritty not to have just like a flat, stoic foam face, you know, like some mascots or just a giant head. They wanted something that could like emote, you know, they right. wanted something that could move its mouth and, and move its eyes and things like that. So from the beginning, we kind of knew that like a puppet like direction is something we wanted to to hit. Um, and. No, of course, the uh, costume company uh, called Character Translations Incorporated had a huge part in this. You sure. Know, they, they took my turnaround drawing and, and they added some of the coolest features like the, uh, the googly eyes. Was the all, googly all their eyes idea. is phenomenal. And the fact that his waistline is like a hula hoop where it can yeah. sort of move around in an in a unhuman way. That's great. And the, the, the squeaky hands, like there's so a lot of details in there. And this is why I did a whole episode with the hammer time guys about gritty because people were complaining that it was too scary or it was too dangerous. And I want to say to those people, it's like, you know what, just because you decided to bring kids into this world, doesn't mean the whole world <laughs> has to become kid fucking friendly. Like yeah. the flyers, you can take your family there, but you're crazy. If you do, it's Philadelphia. It's a bunch of people that love a sport that's based on a bit of violence, but also showing good sportsmanship. Like, it's a hockey mascot. It shouldn't be a puppy right. dog or a kitten or a fucking emoji. Like it's everything that it should be like gritty with this crazy long beard makes him once again, it feels familiar it's hockey. Lots of guys have beards these days, but it also has that wild seventies vibe to it. When life was a little bit more dangerous, a little bit more risque, like it's just so perfect. And I'm like, the more people are hating this, the more it's making me love this character and the flyers, the way they leaned into the hatred was masterful. I mean, genius. A lot of corporations in 2018 would have put their tail between their legs. We made a mistake. We want to apologize. We're going to immediately scrub gritty from our website. And they just leaned into the folklore. Yeah. And, and that was all a uh, guy named Dave Raymond. He was the guy who created the Philly fanatic. Dave Raymond, you're a genius. Yes, he is a genius, and he was involved with the marketing from the beginning. Um, they knew going into this that there might be a lot of pushback. Uh, and it's funny what you said about the kids finding him creepy because they did a ton of uh, of testing. They, I think they showed it to like 600 kids or something at the beginning, and the kids loved them. See, that's so parents. I, that, that's the parents in today's world were like, <laughs> I don't understand this. It's like everybody's trying to protect yeah. their kids from being kids. Kids get it. Kids always do. Yeah. Kids understand the world better than adults do. It's the bullshit that happens to you from the time that you're 13 to 23 that makes you a horrible person. Oh, yeah, friends. When you hear the bear, you know what that means. It's time to talk about Grizzly Willer. Patches. Oh, how's your patches looking? Do you have a beautiful coat or a bag or a customer that needs a patch? Get it through our friend. <laughs> That's right, Grizzly Wheeler, everybody's friend in Patchin. Go over there and tell them Circle of Trust, Adventures in Design, Mark Bricky. Tell them you heard this show and you're going to get a discount on your next patch. Think about it, a patch. Whatever you need makes it a little bit fancier. A great low-cost item to put into your web store and a great thing to send out around the holidays, right? Send out a patch and win a new customer or a new friend. Oh, that's right, Grizzly. I'll send them all over to you. Grizzlywheeler.com and tell them Bricky and the Bear sent you. 
Yeah, I, and I have two kids, and they their favorite thing in the world is Five Nights at Freddy's, which is like this horrible, <laughs> frightening game where where you get stalked by creatures, you yeah. know, in a uh, amusement park or something. So so kids love they love creepy stuff. I mean, I I do. Uh, so I I I think this is my theory, but I think a lot of that creepy backlash at the beginning was was partly because some of the photos that they first released of Gritty were like really darkly lit like yeah. they were lit from from below yeah. and like i don't know um and maybe that led to it a little bit i don't know i also think that it's one of those things where we live in a moment where only headlines is what people read so a right. headline has to be shocking it has to ask a question it has to be completely titillating and all of the people that are big on youtube that have the millions of followers there are people that have been able to nail and master the headline and the thumbnail and i think that the way the gritty was packaged to the media and the way the media told the story was like are you ready to see the insane mascot that the flyers made flyers made yeah. creepy mascot that scares kids like the sensationalism of the media fake news took gritty and really packaged it as it was this demon. Cause I was watching the today show, which is as uh -huh. milk toast and, and as, you know, safe America as it gets. And they pitched it as this crazy thing that the flyers did. Well, because I'm always looking for content. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'll watch it to 8.30 to see what this is. I saw Gritty. I'm like, yeah. this is genius. It looks like it, like you walked off the set of the Great Space Coaster. Like, this is absolutely genius. And then I started looking at all the hatred around it, and I'm like, oh, they've struck gold. Because anything that can make that much noise in the shadow of Trump, in the shadow of 2018, like anything that can break through is amazing. It's got to be this or a Beauty and the Beast story like Ariana Grande and Pete Davidson. Like those are the only <laughs> things that yeah. break through. And you got into that crazy rarefied air of catching the culture, capturing the moment in 2018, which seems impossible, man. Well, well, thanks, man. But I, I mean, to be honest, I'll tell you, the first couple days, I was uh, terrified. Of course you uh, were. Because I never... I had never dealt with anything like this, and I I was so busy that week with another project that I had kind of forgotten it was even being released. Yeah. They had just sent me a photo of the costume a week before, and a friend sent me a thing, and I clicked on it, and then another friend sent me another thing, and I clicked on it, and it, it just became apparent that the reaction was not good, Yeah, uh, and it, it was not good it, so eventually I ended up on the Flyers uh, Facebook or Twitter feed or something. And you read a couple of the first comments and you think, ah, okay, he didn't like it. You know, maybe the next guy will. But it just kept snowballing. And um, it, it, I haven't felt like that since I was in high school, like being dumped or something. But yeah. it was, it was almost, it was like a whole city was dumping me at once. Um, and, I immediately I called the uh, or emailed the art directors because I was thinking like I'm in damage control. What do I do here? What do we do? Is there a problem um, that I got to fix that we have to fix? And they were like, dude, you got to be patient because this is amazing. Like this is we are ecstatic about how this is going. They knew and the they game. were like, they knew the yeah. game. They knew the media game. They knew that look, if this many people are talking about our mascot. We did everything right. Because the worst thing would be to make something safe, something friendly. They put out a press release and nobody bites back. Like this is right. what you hope for if you're in the media game. Yeah, I wish they had like told me because <laughs> they, they obviously had uh, a really great plan ahead of time. And it, like you said, it's really cool because the negative reaction to Gritty has sort of become part of his personality yes. now. Like he's, he's sort of an anti-mascot yes. now, which is the only way you're going to sell a mascot to the people of Philadelphia. Like I'm not giving the city yeah. of Philadelphia shit. Every city has its own vibe. People in LA are fake and everybody. The first thing they say is, what do you do for a living? <laughs> like it's just, it's a different vibe, right? And yeah. Philly's hard. Philly's tough as nails and they need a mascot that represents their same cynicism. Cyn cynicism? Cynic? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know what it. I'm saying? You know what I'm trying to get out of my mouth? The way that it, it, it came off was a perfect fit for the Flyers and for the city of Philadelphia. Let's not glaze over this, though. 
because you're busy working. You and your wife run Flyland together. So it's a family project. You got two kids. You got overhead. We all know what illustrators make, freelance illustrators make. So we all know you're not a rich guy. And you start to see this negative attention. Now, part of going to art school, you went to Penn State. You have to sit in that circle. You have to show your painted fruit. And everybody critiques it. And it's just building a muscle memory of criticism because clients aren't always going to like your work. People aren't always going to be friendly about what you do in the world of art. Everybody thinks they know better. Trust me, I've made a career off of it. But when you get to that level of making it to the six o'clock news, making it to the morning news, making it to national news, making it to the late night shows, making it to HBO, when you get to that level of people talking shit and preparing five minute bits about how bad you did your job, how were you able to turn the corner and to take this as a badge of honor and not just let it make you want to be an ostrich and bury your head in the sand? Yeah, man, it, that was definitely my first reaction. Um, my, my wife told me she pretty much shut me in a room and I wasn't allowed to look at Twitter. She, I had her just kind of monitoring social media. Nice. One of the things I was a little afraid of at first was that if once people found out I was the designer behind it, I was kind of worried about like, a brute force social media attack, like yeah. anti anti fans coming. Cause that, that had actually happened to me uh, a couple years ago with something completely different. And, uh, it's a whole different story, but, um, what was it? What'd you do? Oh, I, so I won't make this a long story, but basically I had done a piece of artwork and there was a famous band that stole the artwork. Okay. Um, Who's to the use it on their t-shirt. Uh, it's called blood on the dance floor. Okay. A lot of people steal my artwork because it's it's kind of out there in Google, so it happens, and yeah. we try to fight it when we can. But I looked up the band, and I saw that they had like 2 million followers, which is usually – it's usually like you find somebody, and they just have 100 followers or something. Like, it's not it, even worth so. it. They're just like a high school kid band, and they just Googled something for a T-shirt, whatever. I, exactly. Anyway, I'll, I'll skip the middle part, but what happened was – they, this, I, I got to be careful, but the lead singer of this band had been accused of some nasty crimes mm. in his past. Mm. Okay. Uh, you can look that up, but he had established like hundreds of thousands of anti fans that pretty much try to destroy everything he does. So these people thought that I was working with him, even though I wasn't, I wasn't working with him at all. It, he actually took artwork from me that looked you know, just like mine. So what they did was these guys started calling me in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m., 4 a.m., just calling and hanging up. And then they would post all over my social media pages that like Brian Allen works with accused pedophiles. And this was, I mean, they would post it so many times that like you could barely keep up. This, uh, the lead singer had been accused of like some underage stuff. sex crimes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. some stuff. Yeah. Yes, yeah. let's say I should have said stuff. So they would call me in the middle of the night. They'd be calling me at like three and four in the morning and just hanging up. They started posting all over my social media pages on Twitter, on Facebook, saying, you know, don't work with Brian Allen. He works with pedophiles. And <laughs> you never worked with this, him. This, <laughs> and and I didn't work with him. He, he took my art. Yeah. And, and I, as, as soon as I tried to explain that, they would say, you're lying because they found another business who lied about working with them too or something. Right, right. Um, but, you know, my, my kids' parents follow me on social media. They're teachers. Right. Uh, all, of my, all of my clients. So I was really freaked out. So Gritty, so I guess that was like the, that, Gritty wasn't as bad as that. No, 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 no. Uh, but you had had a taste but, of being trolled, right? And Yeah, and, and we were worried about that. Like the first sure. day I had my wife just, I, I stepped away from it because I had to, to get back to work. And uh, she kind of monitored it to make sure nothing was going on. Um, but luckily, what I found was most of the negative comments were all on like the f- flyers page. Most people on my pages, and I don't have a huge following, but right. most of the comments were were really positive, like people saying they love it or, you know, congrats and stuff. Um, 
I did have this one woman, one of my favorite messages I got. Uh, one woman messaged me and said, you need to fired with that demonic creation, like all in caps. <laughs> that, you need fired. That was very nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you need to fired. Well, uh, and then other people would meant that like, oh, uh, I should, I should ha- give my money back and stuff like that. But, but that died down fast. Uh, that really was the first couple days. Mm-hmm. And then I started noticing like a huge momentum shift. Uh, and I think that followed when, um, when Gritty went out on the ice the first time and, and fell on his ass. Yeah. Uh, and then grabbed the t-shirt cannon from a guy and started firing shirts at people. Yeah. I, I think that's when people kind of realize, like, okay, this dude's here to stay, and he's kind of fun. Like, like we we can fuck with him a little bit, and he's he's going to fuck with us back, and that that could be cool. Uh, because it was at that point that I started receiving uh, lots of fan art from people. Um, so people were sending me pictures of cakes that they made uh some woman drew gritty on an etch-a-sketch oh, and took a photo. it was like a beautiful that's it's all she does They're like these beautiful yeah. portraits and uh b- then then the tattoos started um and now you're seeing halloween costumes so it it really only the horror for me really only lasted about two to three days but i bet it was a rough two or three days i mean really putting myself in your situation that would be pretty brutal because you don't know how the trolls are going to come after you. You don't know how you might get dragged into this. And like reputation as a freelancer, that's all you have, right? And if for some reason right. this thing would have broke that, what do you do? Like, what do you do if you lose your namesake? I mean, you've got an amazing website that's full of tons of artwork. It's all super graphic like you're the guy to be able to just bang out like a t-shirt logo like that's where you just excel it's just sort of you can put the characters in there you know how to keep it in sort of an organic shape you know how to frame it with the copy and the type like you've got a really good thing going your line art is amazing so you're the perfect guy to be making brushes and and doing your youtube channel where you give tutorials and congratulations on twelve thousand subs on youtube not an easy number to get Uh, to i'm I'm envious of that one but you've got a good thing going here like you're even such a nice guy you got your portfolio broken into uh dark work and lighter work (laughs) so if people want you know a fucking zombie eating a chicken you're the guy but if they also want that chicken selling you a chicken sandwich, which is always weird when a chicken is like, just eat my cousin. You're also right. right. You're also that guy. So I could understand where you'd be worried that this is just going to break. What's a good thing. I mean, your job is not an easy job being a freelance illustrator, not an easy thing to do in this world. You're one of the few people that has been able to become a success at it. If, if I said something crazy on the show, and it was going viral. I know that I would have a fucking panic attack. Like I for sure know I would have a panic attack. If iTunes does something where you can now sell podcasts, like my career is tied up into so many weird technology things that nobody knows what's going to happen in the next 12 months or 12 weeks or 12 days. I understand how good on the wife go into a room Get away from it. I'll monitor it. So if you don't hear from me, that means that nothing bad's happening. And just keep pushing the pen. Get the work done. Because something like this could literally disrupt an entire week of your life. Yeah. And and I felt like I feel like cursed is way too strong of a word. But like I used it with my wife because and I'm sure people can relate to this. I've had a lot of opportunities that were amazing opportunities. And then they just fell apart at the last second. Yes. So like I, um, I was hired to do the official, um, alien pinball machine, mm-hmm. uh, like the back glass for the pinball machine. Yeah. And this was something I had always wanted to work on a pinball machine and it, it was for a property I loved and all this stuff. And I did the design and I, I was proud of it. People loved it. And then just before the machines went to production, the whole company went bankrupt and it had nothing to do with me or my design. It's just the way it goes sometimes. It's just the way it goes. Uh, but I, at that moment, I kind of felt like maybe it goes a little too much 
to me, you yeah. know, in those directions. But uh, but of course, that's being uh, totally uh, unfair to the situation to feel like that. There was a there was a recent thing where I did something for a pretty big musician, and I'm always I would love to work more in the music industry. Yeah, but the whole thing fell apart because it turned out he didn't have the contract to do his own licensing or something. Yeah. So none of that work, I'm not allowed to show it. I'm not even allowed to tell anybody who he is. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I talk to my peers, those things, it's just part of the game, but it doesn't, doesn't make it feel better. But this one did turn around to be a hit. Yeah. And I understand that feeling curse. Like, and I think that most people who are listening. know. Hey, we're going to be a utility client. Like if you can help us get this branded and get this going, we're going to be great. And it all looks like it's going to work out. And you're like, my God, I'm going to have constant income for the next two years. And then your lead project launches project gets a good response. Your lead goes and moves to another business someplace. They right. use this project as a stepping stone. That's what happened to me when I uh, did a bunch of characters for uh, the rebranding of a newspaper and they were going to make mascots and it was all going to go this way. And little did I know the woman who hired me was hiring us because they knew we would do well, used our work as a springboard to go get a job elsewhere. And then the whole thing got abandoned. Oh man. And, and I know dirty. That. Like I don't, at this point in my career, I don't believe anything until not only until it's happened, but until it's happened and it's over and it's a success because you just get your heart broken a thousand times. But luckily for you, it seems like good old gritty fought back. He bounced back and he's here to stay, man. Like he is very, very adored, very lovable. He's been adopted by the city of Philadelphia. You really are attached to something that is pure pop culture. Yeah. It's, it's pretty insane, man. And I'm going to be, meeting him uh next week they uh, the flyers got my family and i tickets so we're going to the first game um that we've been to and we can hopefully get a picture with them and stuff which is pretty unreal because i've i've been lucky enough to design a lot of things for companies and people but rarely you know rarely have i ever designed anything that you can like high five you know and, <laughs> and, and uh and go meet like, I'm going to go yeah. meet my drawing. I'm going to go meet something that came out of my dumb head. And I remember, let me give you a little bit of advice, Brian. High five him. Don't hug him. There you go, friends. There's part one of today's episode with Brian Allen of FlylandDesigns.com. Make sure you head over there. Check out his web store. Grab a set of those brushes. Maybe kick the tires on that, that illustration program. He makes it sound pretty fun. I know I'm going to load it up on my iPad on my next break and see how it draws kind of getting sick of procreate there's just like a couple things in it that just yeah, it irritates me and if i can help out brian then i will and he'll help you out keep on code cot all right speaking of the cot coming up in part two we'll talk a little bit more about uh the wild ride that brian's been on this fall with creating gritty but in part two we really talk about where does it all go you know, you get to this moment in your career where there's only so many hours that you can sit at your desk and, and illustrate and, and, and turn in the work. At some moment, you got to start looking at passive income. You got to start looking at how do I make more? And also, at some moment, we have to evaluate ourselves and say, what is my style? I've worked hard. I've bust my hump. I've created my craft. I've become a great illustrator, a great designer. What is my voice? What it, what separates me in the marketplace? I don't know the answers, but it's a journey that we're all on. And Brian and I discuss that today in part two. We look at his web store, we look at his career, and we ask ourselves, where is this going? What's the best way to get there? And I share with Brian a couple of the things that have always frustrated me. And maybe, maybe an idea or a solution on what the circle of trust can do in the upcoming year to connect some loose ends and bring it all together and make some new friends to hear part two of today's episode. You got to be a member of the circle of trust, head over to our brand new website, aid.network sign up to unlock the second part of today's episode, as well as our archive of over 840 episodes. We are not going anywhere. Uh, yesterday's episode was my stab at fake news. Don't believe the media. I'm just as corrupt as the rest of them. 
Oh, it's a weird day to say that. That's It sucks these days. Like, you can't even do a crazy episode because the day that you do it, it's like people are sending bombs to the media and shit. Like, what a world we live in. Well, we can control the world that we're a part of, and we can control the circle of trust and the conversations we have where we celebrate those just like us that want to turn a passion into something that is profitable enough to create a level of happiness. That's coming up. In part two of today's episode, sign up today at AIDnetwork.com, become a member of the Circle of Trust, support the show, and keep us here for 200 more episodes in 2019. Oh, it's going to happen next year. Bricky's going to hit 1,000. Can you hit 1,000? I think I can. I know I can. I will. 960's already done. That's good. Just got to get right past that. By the way, listen to tomorrow's episode or yesterday's episode again. So many Easter eggs. And next week, we've got three more episodes of an extended creep week coming your way. Let's get back into part two. Brian Allen, father of Grite. Right, right. I, I'm going to hug him and I'll For probably sure cry. For sure you are. You should cry. I mean, what a moment in your life. I know I would cry. I would feel humbled by all of this. So here's the awkward thing. Yeah, let's do it. Illustrators are normally anonymous in the project. Normally, nobody knows who we are. There's probably tattoo artists that are getting more recognition than you are for doing tattoos or yeah. etch a sketch lady or person on cake or the first guy that builds Gritty out of snow and spray paints it in his front yard. Like, you know, Gritty's now a cultural moment and he's out of your hands. You did them. You got paid for your work. You gave them back to the flyers. The flyers gave them to the world. And now your little bird has flown away. Have any opportunities from Gritty work their way back to you? Because I know people at home are thinking, you become the guy that does Gritty, that opens doors. That changes your career. Right. You made viral. Have you made one extra dollar from Gritty yet? Well, a lot of people assume, too, that that I'm getting royalties for everything gritty is on. Yeah. yeah that's my, that's my response. I, uh, I, I guess the, maybe it was the Philly fanatic or a previous mascot. Um, the creator did keep all the rights to the illustration and then later sold it back for probably quite a bit of money. Sure. But they learned, they learned from that. Um, but, but so let me just say, I'm, I'm real happy with what I got. And then, of course, the exposure is huge. But uh, no, I actually haven't gotten anything beyond I have been getting a lot of calls from people who want to put Gritty on a T-shirt. And it's like, well, you know, uh, I created him, but he's not mine anymore. So go talk to the Flyers guy. Go talk to the Flyers. And yeah, yeah, good luck with that. I love that people are trying to circumvent, like they're trying to sneak around the back door to get Gritty usage. Oh, yeah. I love what shady fuckers. (laughs) It yeah. owns. Hey, it belongs to the Philadelphia Flyers. I, I mean, I, I understand that, but they're just trying to find a, a workaround. And dude, the the days of an artist owning their character are long gone, long gone. Like that would never happen today, unless you are already a famous person. So, right, you might and have a little bit of wiggle room. The next time you get invited to the ball, Brian, and don't sell yourself short in that department because you are a guy that's capable of making a viral piece of pop culture. So the next time at bat, shoot for a fucking grand slam, my friend. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that because I I stress about that a lot. And we I have especially since I started listening to your show a few years ago, like I have really been trying to steadily raise my prices, fight for more rights. And we've been making leeway i think uh but it it, i i have talked to so many people who maybe did this in the 90s and the 80s and they all say the same thing those days are over i mean it's it's different so i am glad i could have fought for that but i would have lost the job um i don't think there's any question there here's why you're smart you got a fair amount of money he got paid well. He can't say what he got said, and the gentleman doesn't ask. But trust me, he got paid a fair <laughs> amount of money for the work that he did. But you didn't overshoot it. You knew that getting this job was an important building block to your career. And boy, oh boy, the one thing that you underestimated is what a big building block this would be. So now you are father of Gritty. You should 
brand that. You should let people know that because that is worth a lot. You have the culture in your back pocket. You have what they call street cred. Spend it appropriately, my friend. Um, yeah, and it's funny. You, I think you alluded to this. I've been trying to let people know wherever I can uh, on my social media channels, you know, but what will happen is when I post a picture of Gritty and say, hey, you know, I, I made it will get maybe I, I don't know. I don't know the number, but not not enough likes to make me happy about it. And then I'll see that a tattoo artist does a tattoo of Gritty and he'll get like 20,000 likes right, and he's reshares a and he's on the news. Yeah. So it's it's tattoo tricky. Artists, tracers of the world. <laughs> uh, but there have been some great some great Gritty tattoos. Um but as far as other opportunities, I did have a couple uh, agencies reach out and just say, hey, congratulations. Yeah. You know, maybe we can work together someday. Yeah, that that alone is big because we don't my, my art style doesn't usually appeal to big agencies. You know, I mean, I've got kind of like a lowbrow uh sort of 80s um you're stuck in a time i don't know real you're, colorful yeah you, artwork your illustration style is okay it's not right for everybody your illustration style but it's perfect for some right so you're in that moment of a lot of colors you don't you know pull back on the color palette it'd be interesting to see what would happen if you did but it's a lot of colors but it's precision line weight you're good at character design it looks like you're influenced from Thanks, you know the the 70s and like mad magazine and all that kind of stuff and i say to you yeah absolutely do not chase the trends stay where you are because everything comes back around and you're really good at tiki. You're really good at pinup. You're really good at Americana. You're good at character design. And, you know, if you start chasing the trends, that's all you'll do the rest of your life is chase them. You're a leader and an innovator in the world that you exist from and the world that it inspired you. Stay where you're at because there's a culture that supports that. Like you could go do, you know, these Halloween shows. You could become a part of that world. You could become a part of the tiki world. Like you, you've got a good thing going, man. And I understand that, you know, you probably sometimes feel like, oh, if I had a more hip modern style, I might get other opportunities. But you're really great at what you do. And it's a piece of American history. Oh, and it's, it's cool that you're keeping that torch alive. Hey, dude, that's that's huge. Thanks so much, man. Um, it, it's funny when you mentioned that show with Hammer Time, like when Gritty first released and people were talking down on on it, I had like a waking nightmare that I would hear your show someday and like you and Billy <laughs> Billy Bauman would be ripping this apart, ripping apart Gritty. And so it's, it's, so, it's so great. Thank you for saying that. Um, and I definitely, I have, I experienced the most growth when I stopped doing things that I wasn't good at and yep. just really focused on my own style, because then I started getting, instead of jobs saying, Hey, we need a t-shirt. They would say, we need a t-shirt that looks like your artwork. Yes. You know what I yes. mean? When and, you get and once, clients, once you started getting that. Yes. When they start requesting your greatest hits, you know, you're in a good spot. Right. And the one of the things I used to always do is when people would come to us and be like, oh, we really love the, this work that you did. We love this work you did. And then they'd start to art direct too much. I always love saying, hey, you came to me for these five projects. You never right. requested this poster that I did for Mo. You see that Mo poster? You don't like that, right? Well, that's when the client gets too involved. So if you just hold that, <laughs> I can give you what you asked for. That's but if you idea. keep going down the critique path, you're going to end up with that piece of shit that nobody's ever called Mo. me and asked for. Mo. Cool. So. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. I, no, you don't. So the artwork, <laughs> the artwork that you do is a very definitive style. And, you know, there is a culture that exists behind that. And, and there are applications that are really good for it. And I think if I were you, I would lean in to the campiness of it. And I think that there's a real way where you could make stuff that's, you could make stuff that's completely hip by being satirical and knowing that you have sort of an older style that's not real current right now. But if you, if you tell the right joke with it, I think that it could be phenomenal. You know, if you look at, um, tall boy that I have on the show, you know, he, Oh he, yeah. He kind of comes from your world, but a little bit more of a modern take on it, but because he always nails the subject matter, it becomes completely hip, you know? So there, you know, I, you're, you're in a, an interesting spot in your career, but 
the artwork and the level of illustration you do, man, you know, you're too good to change up what you're doing or, or chase, you know, passing trends. Oh, thanks, man. I, I love tall boys work. It's so good. I think I, I know I follow him. I might've talked to him once or twice. He's a nice before, guy in the world, but yeah, he's got, he knows, he strikes me as a guy who knows what he's doing. Yes. Um, you know, he's got to figure it out being a guy who doesn't, so yeah, he's one of the guys who has to figure. So let, um, I, let's do this real quick. Oh, and yeah. those agents sees that are coming to you. I can tell you what that's all about. I have, I know, I know all the scams. So those agencies that are yeah. like, "Hey, man, we should work with you sometime." Those calls. That's somebody testing the water. They're contacting you to be like hey buddy you're fucking great love what you did congratulations they're putting you into their rolodex or as the kid on ozark season two said a paper wheel they're they're putting you in their line of contacts because people that work that world they don't know when they're going to need you but they want to have a guy like you in their back pocket and by making contact now, they could be like, hey, Brian, haven't talked to you since the gritty launch. Um, interesting thing. Got a client that's looking to repackage cheeseburgers. You think you could draw a dancing cheeseburger? You know what I mean? Like those people are just literally putting yeah. a placeholder on you. Um, and so, yeah, it sucks that none of them came to you with a $30,000 project this month. But that's a good sign that those slimy types are reaching out. But when they come back, proceed with caution, my friend. Right. Yeah. And I've been there too. I've been on this one client invited me to a conference call and, uh, (laughs) they, I can't, I can't remember the name. I don't, I can't remember the name, but it was big enough that when I looked it up, I got real excited about it. And then when I got on the conference call, they, they wanted to pay $25 per illustration. It's something that, uh, I mean, I get low quotes all the time, but I've never heard that ever from such a big company. And the fact that I, they wanted me to waste the time just on the conference call was just insane. Oh, you felt like you should have built them for the call. No, I had a company, I I I had a company reach out to me and they're doing this new thing where it's like, you know, you can stream a podcast live, which gives your audience an ability to call in live. So they're basically trying to take podcasting and make it more like, you know, traditional radio. So yeah, they wanted me to host a couple of these podcasts that then they would, I would be able to publish it as usual, but they'd also be able to host it so people could get an example of what it looked like. So I said, and they wanted it to happen as soon as possible. I'm like, I could turn this into an actual show where it would be like a community show on AID. Like basically I've been on the radio now for years. People could call in, ask me questions and it'd just basically be like, the audience is my co-host and I would do one like once a week and I'd put it in the schedule and I quoted them $5,000 to do, yeah. I think five or, or 10 of these. I can't remember. I, I think it was like 5,000 for one quote, 7,500 for the other one. And you know, I was thinking like, dude, if I use their platform, I got to make these shows anyway. If I can make, you know, five or seven G's like, that's great. Why not do it? Then I looked at their website after I put together my quote, they're like, <laughs> become an influencer. We'll pay you. Twenty dollars a podcast, and I was oh, like, "Oh, nice! What the fuck? I'm a <laughs> pro. What am I supposed to do with twenty dollars? Like, don't get me wrong. If I see a twenty on the street, right. I'm not above bending over and picking the fucking thing up. But what am I actively <laughs> going to go out of my way to earn twenty dollars? Like, I live in Southern California. Twenty dollars would maybe cover my lunch if I walk down to Second Street, but I can't bring my fucking wife with right. me. Get out of right. here! All right. It, yeah. It's, do you it's, have? That's their loss, man. Thank you, because everybody knows I'm the best yeah, at ahead. this, and that's why I talk all over my guests. So, well, you go ahead. I, Tell I, me I how great I am. I, Do it, Brian so, Allen. I, I was just gonna say, like, I would, I would watch the shit out of a show where you did take callers from guests, or even just tweets or something, um, just like the regular folks, like like me, just asking questions and getting guidance and things like that. That would be. Uh, I don't know if that would be annoying to you. Well, we or did it for a together. while. We did it at a show called Breaking News where people could ask us a question and then Breaking News, we'd answer it. But then after a while, okay. the questions were either the same or the questions stopped coming. So I don't know. Maybe, uh, gotcha. maybe it wouldn't be a bad like once a month type thing to do in the new year as I start to shift things up. But, all right, let me ask you this. And then I want to Go get ahead. into the, the, the brushes and the passive income stuff that you've done. Um, do you have... What are your 
parental rights to Gritty? Like, I saw that you're selling a poster, but yeah, are you allowed? Are you as an individual? Like, could you make a gritty T-shirt? Could you make a poster? Are you allowed to make gritty content as father? Do you have any parental rights? I do not have any of those rights explicitly outlined in the contract. So anything that I made would have to be fan art. So the the print, I am selling a print in my shop, but it doesn't have the Flyers logo on it. And it's basically just my take on my own take <laughs> all right you know. uh, can you go so, to a convention can you go to like can you go to the city of philadelphia or can you go to an nhl convention and can you be the gritty guy and do like fan art illustrations of gritty and sign them to people for like you know 50 bucks each yeah it's funny you say that because i was just in a convention a couple weeks ago uh, uh just outside of philadelphia and i did exactly that i didn't intend on it but somehow the news got out that I was that guy and people just kept coming up to me and I must have done uh, maybe like 10 sketches for people, which uh, which is a lot for me because I don't I actually don't normally do conventions. It's it's something that my wife and I are just starting to try. Um, but but yeah, I I was selling a print there and, and that did all right. Uh I, I guess I look at it as the same way that everybody in that aisle is selling a Captain America and a Deadpool. See, no, you're you know, different now. I'm, you're different. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, right, right. And I, I'm, I'm trying to be careful about it. Uh, I'm trying not to flaunt it. I, w- what I want to do is eventually, um, I have a good relationship with the art directors, I think, at the Flyers. So I would like to remain involved with them and, yeah, and maybe so you don't want to burn any do bridges. t-shirt designs for yeah, yeah. I, I want to do stuff for them and for the gritty marketing i'll have to you know i'll have to pitch that later on but i would think though at this moment, I, I would think though that from what i'm getting from the vibe of the flyers and how forward thinking they are that to have a guy at conventions that's the, you know, because it one, it shows that a real live like illustrator artist created their mascot and it's not just something fabricated from nowhere, that they might see an appeal to having somebody like you at conventions doing signings, doing gritty drawings or, you know, like drawing people like gritty or, you know, doing gritty likenesses and stuff like that. Like you, you, you might want to float it past them because they might be open to a thing like that. Like they might even have you come out to the stadium or to different fan events you know as an attraction like here's the guy who did gritty and he does gritty sketches for the kids for you know 25 50 bucks like you might want to bounce it off of them they might be into that because it makes it seem more like a superhero or something from the marvel universe than just a mascot and they seem to have a different approach on this yeah man i mean that's such a great idea i was um i was planning on pitching some things like that yeah i'm i'm just i'm waiting until the dust settles a little bit sure of course what i because, you know, you made the comment that like an illustrator usually is the least visible portion of the team, right? Right. We're not. Um, so I, I, I kind of got lucky. I think the whole reason that even happened was my local newspaper interviewed me and I, and I, I from, I'm from a small town. So like for me to do that was a big deal. And I didn't even think that much of it. But as soon as they posted it, all the Philadelphia papers, they saw that and then they got all the information from it and then it just it kind of like snowballed so my business name and my name wasn't even really part of the official flyers news release really so i i think and then from there i did i ended up doing like 10 interviews which i had you know i had never done one in my life really yeah. um which is just amazing and well, i'm humbling, pissed but- off that you didn't give aid the exclusive Oh, sorry, man. How dare well, this you? is the one uh, I was most nervous about. Um, <laughs> Be quiet. This is, you know, it's funny. Uh, the other, the other interviewers, like they interviewed me for like ten minutes, but then they they edited it to like a thirty second clip or not even. Yeah. And what I said like barely made sense, and it wasn't really the whole story. So, I know. Um, They're brutal. Uh, I'm excited. To, I'm excited about this because I think, you know, if the story is interesting, this is definitely the biggest take on it out there. Well, I mean, I, I think yeah, what that was I, saying? I think there's a lot that everybody can learn from this experience, you know, not only like the getting dragged through the mud, but creating, you know, a pop icon. And so many of us do 
the job where it's four sketches. You know, a lot of us deliver 25 and it goes nowhere and you just kick yourself in the ass. Right. Like, I'm just a loser. Like this job's never going to work out. It's never going to pan out for me. And like, we need a success story. You know, we need somebody that's like, look, man, I just went all in. I gave them 200% more than what they asked for. And it, and it landed for me and it won and it, it's become a big moment. And I hope that, you know, you and I talk again in a year and that Gritty has popped off and, and led to other things and that, you know, there's a whole, you know, um, a whole level of opportunities that comes your way from doing this. And this is also why AID exists, right? It's like to tell these type of stories, not in a quick paragraph. So grandma can be like, this is who made Gritty. But to understand the, the the mindset behind it, you know, and I, I hope that you can figure out a way to, you know, let them pay you or collaborate on, you know, a graphic novel or a, a web series or some doing some graphics that are in arena, you know, some animation stuff for the boards. Like, I hope that it turns into a whole snowball of projects for you and that, you know, that uh, that we get to see gritty son of gritty for a children's event or something you know like, right. like let's make gritty a universe yeah i was just talking to the costume company because they want to they were considering doing like a brock gritty and trying to pitch that to the flyers you know oh, so, what kind of gritty? i don't know uh the bride of gritty like a female gritty <laughs> uh so just imagine how horrifying that would look. I wouldn't ever put a female mascot out on the ice in the Philadelphia <laughs> arena. And I mean, no disrespect <laughs> to the people of Philadelphia. I just think you're playing with fire there. I think you're playing with a lot yeah. of fire. I think Gritty was very safe. Um, is it true or false that my red beard inspired the red beard of Gritty? True or false? <laughs> well, yeah, was a little bit of it, but Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid to tell you or you're going to. You're going to want royalties or something. No. Um, Dude, there's but. been there's been a subtle nod of people that listen to AID sneaking our language and our metaphors into, <laughs> into things in pop culture. And it's starting to get a little bit wild. And when I read to the guys at VG, I'm like, dude, the guy that designed Gritty listens to the show. And then Tavo's like, fucking designed it after you, redheaded motherfucker. I'm like, all right, easy, <laughs> easy, Tavo. Don't get me started. Don't get the hate train going here, Tavo. Um, all right, so let's do this. Gritty, smashing success. What a great story for Creep Week. A guy who made a real monster. And then just like the people, you know, a lot of people don't know this. I always like to give this disclaimer. Frankenstein is the guy who made the monster. It's Frankenstein apostrophe S monster. And when the monster went out, the people ran after him with torches, just like they did poor Gritty. But then, once they realized what was done, they said, that Frankenstein has a smart son of a bitch. And that <laughs> is Brian Allen. So what a great story to tell during Creep Week. Will you stop the construction? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Open the window for a second because my room's so. smelling like balls. And then they start up the power saw. So... Nice. Great story. Let's get into the circle of trust for paid members and let's talk all about the passive income things that you've done. Like your art style may not be for everybody, but your illustration style, the way that you have been able to master the, the line art, smooth lines, line weight, you're a perfect guy to design his own brush. I'd love to talk to you about the success of that. And I'd also love to talk to you about where you think that all of this is going and if you have any ideas to, to create more out of doing gritty. So let's jump in right now to Circle of Trust members and uh, let's let's learn about the world of fly land design and the brushes. Let's do it. Thanks, man. All right. So when you did the brushes, what, what was the idea? Because I know that you didn't design them for Photoshop. You designed them for a program that's more popular, like for like Magna, 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 Magna. It's yeah, it's ma it's manga. Yeah, and I I had been I had been saying it wrong saying it wrong for years actually until people started yelling at me. But uh, it's called Manga Studio Five, um, but they've rebranded it. It's called Clip Studio Paint yeah. now. It's it's not it's not the best name, but um, it's it's a fantastic program, and anyone who loves drawing in Photoshop, I think, should try it because yeah. it's super cheap. It's only fifty bucks one time. And it's, it works very similar to Photoshop. It's got all the, the layers and the actions and the tools that you would expect. But it has, I think, a much better brush engine, uh, especially when it comes to inking. And it also has a lot of 
tools like symmetry and uh, like different warps and rulers that I, and also vector layers. So you can like, you can make your line art vectors and combine right it with gate. raster at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's, so anyway, so I, why did you, des- why did you design the brushes? Like what problem were you trying to fix in the marketplace? Sure. So I, um, I already had just a ton of brushes, like probably over a hundred because I love the program, but I thought some of the brushes were a little lacking or they could have gone a little farther. Right. So I just, I just kept tweaking them and, um, I had bought, uh, artist, a really talented artist named Ray Frendon, and he had done a whole set of brushes. So I bought those and I really enjoyed those, but I ended up still just kind of making my own because 